Welcome. I'm Lola Rain and I'm with Sequoia Living. Today you're here for a webinar on fall prevention. If you're watching live, it's September 21st, 2022, and it's National Fall Prevention and Awareness Week. The recording of today's presentation will be made possible for viewing on our in-house television network, our YouTube channel, and on our website at sequoialiving.org forward slash webinars. Today's presenters are Calvin Growawig with Sequoia Living and Dr. Christian Thompson with USF. Before we get started, I wanna thank our sponsor today, which is Senior Services for Northern California, the Philanthropic Foundation of Sequoia Living. Now, Sequoia Living has been a nonprofit since 1958, and we provide homes and services uh, across the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. We have four continuing care retirement communities, three affordable housing communities, and two senior centers. Senior Services for Northern California uh, raises funds to help support our senior service, our senior centers, which are located in the Tenderloin District of, District of San Francisco, as well as Aquatic Park. We also have a partnership with AARP Experience Corps, and that is where older adults and school-aged children read together, and it's a volunteer program. And then we have resident service programs across the Bay Area at affordable housing communities. And then we also have an intergenerational program where older adults and younger people get together and enjoy things like cooking, sharing stories, and just having a really good time getting to know each other. So thank you to Senior Services for Northern California for being our sponsor today and making this program possible. I'd like to um, do just a little bit of housekeeping. If you're watching live, you can use the Q&A box at any time during today's presentation. And we'll have two sections where we'll um, answer questions for you. So let's go ahead and welcome our first presenter. And that is uh, Cal Grow, Grow Wig. And Cal, welcome. Thank you, Lola, welcome. So we're excited to hear about um, why fall prevention is so important to you and to Sequoia Living. So I'll give you the floor. Sure, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see uh, many of you logging in. Um, and I'm we're very, very happy to present today's educational webinar on fall prevention. Sequoia Living has worked on various educational materials over the years for residents and staff to help improve wellness. As an organization, Sequoia Living strives to help educate our residents and our staff and to help improve overall wellness and to achieve improved outcomes whenever possible. At Sequoia Living, our motto, never stop growing, is organized into categories of our strategic priorities for 2022 strengthening our core, prioritizing people power, unify our brand and culture, and future-proofing. This presentation today is extremely important to me um, and I'm sure to many nurses out there, so I want you to listen carefully to what Dr. Thompson has to say. He will provide tips on environmental checks, strengthening, for you as an individual and overall safety in your apartment or environment. As many of you probably know, falls are the number one healthcare issue that plagues our industry and hospitals. Falls occur in your settings at your home, in your apartments, when you're out walking about the environment. So it is really important to basically pay attention to various tips that you'll learn today so that hopefully you won't have a catastrophic incident. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Thompson. 
Okay, so welcome, Dr. Thompson. We're excited to have you today. I do want to remind our audience that we have a lot of resources on our website. So visit sequoialiving.org and under our news and resource section, we have a page just on fall prevention. So a lot of that um, Dr. Thompson will be sharing today, but there are also links that you can uh, click on that go to the National Council on Aging, and they have a plethora of of um, different resources there as well. So Dr. Thompson, let's turn it on over to you and Cal and I will turn off our screens so that you can share your presentation. Thank you very much, Lola. And thank you, Cal. Thanks to Sequoia Living and uh, the opportunity to present to all of you today. I've had some great experiences with Sequoia Living over the years, a little bit that I will touch on. And um, my main goal today is to kind of enlighten everybody about what it takes from a physical perspective to reduce fall risk to the best of our ability. So I'm gonna share screen right now, go to a PowerPoint presentation. I have whipped together for this particular presentation. Um, and I've titled it, Exercise is Medicine. Balanced training reduces falls in older adults. Exercise is medicine is a motto that is promoted by the primary professional organization of kinesiologists, and that is the American College of Sports Medicine. And certainly we know exercise helps things like heart disease and diabetes to be managed and even pre prevented, but we also need to recognize that falls can be managed and prevented with exercise as well. So no question, exercise is medicine. It's good to see all of you. I'm part of the Department of Kinesiology at the University of San Francisco uh, in my 21st year on faculty there, which is just mind blowing to me. And here's a picture of me with my mom who now lives down in Florida. We'll see a little bit of my mom a bit later as well. So I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, um, have had a long history in this area of study. Um, as I said previously, I was on faculty at USF since 2002. Um, I've been working with UCSF Medical Center on older adult exercise programs since 2016. And our big organization, the American College of Sports Medicine, I've been trying to ensure that older adult issues stay at the forefront of what that organization advocates for. And locally in the Bay Area, I've been involved with a program called Always Active, which delivers exercise programs, including fall prevention programming to literally thousands of older adults. And we started that back in 2007. And one of our flagship sites continues to be Aquatic Park Senior Center, which is run by Sequoia Living. So great to be here. Uh, I just want to emphasize that what we're talking about today has been my career passion ever since I was at University of San Francisco or University of Kansas. Probably my first older adult trained participant that I ever worked with was Mrs. Krieger. She was a resident at a CCRC, a continuing care retirement community in Lawrence, Kansas called Brandon Woods. And I trained her for 12 weeks and working with somebody like Mrs. Krieger hooked me on working with older adults and recognizing that there's so much life still left to live and so much desire to live and enjoy life, even in somebody's ninth decade of life, which Mrs. Krieger happened to be. So it lit a spark in me. That spark has continued all the way to my work at University of San Francisco. Here's the beautiful campus. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the campus and have come to uh, talks or the Fromm Institute, which is a lifelong learning program based at USF. And it's just been a joy to work there for many years. And here I am out in the community at Aquatic Park Senior Center, working with one of our fall prevention participants, good old Harry. And he is going through a little mobility ladder with me, me and working on reducing his fall risk through developing better stepping patterns. Um, clearly, what I do really fills me with joy. I get to uh, work with students at USF. Many of these students have been involved with me at our community-based sites and research looking at older adult exercise programming. 
Here again, picture of some uh, participants at Aquatic Park with one of my students going through some exercise programming for fall prevention. During COVID, I've been running webinars and exercise sessions on Zoom with many older adults. I've gotten to present with students at conferences. These were students that helped me with the project at UCSF Medical Center. Uh, and we presented this poster presentation at a national meeting in Boston back in 2017. Just a great experience. Here I am with one of my older adults. We always have this little battle. They don't like it when I make them exercise, but they know it's good for them. And certainly just this, this is something that is really a joyful experience for me. Um, and we try to promote a uh, better understanding of how exercise can reduce fall risk. Uh, back in early 2019, I published my latest article in the Translational Journal of the American College of Sports Medicine and the data that we collected to show how effective our 12-week program for reducing fall risk happened to be was all collected through our always active program one of the sites, again, being Aquatic Park Senior Center. So it's great to be presenting and connecting with Sequoia Living yet again. So today's objectives, we really want to kind of go through a little bit of a journey together. Uh, it's important we recognize uh, why it is that falls are such an issue. Cal noted that it's, it's one of the biggest concerns that we have um, from a medical community recognizing that falls can be devastating in lives of older adults. They can affect them emotionally as well as physically. And we want to really get a sense of why that is and how many uh, risks we have out there in the world. Because unfortunately, our world is filled with risks that could lead us to falls. And then we have to understand how the body changes as we get older, which unfortunately amplify the likelihood of us sustaining a fall when exposed to those fall risk factors. And then I'm really gonna make a push as a kinesiologist, somebody who studies exercise science to try to position exercise as the cornerstone of everybody's fall risk reduction programs. Whatever you're doing at home, uh, we want to ensure that exercise is a part of your plan. And then we're gonna practice some exercise as well. So we'll have some fun with that. I told you I would show you another picture of my mom. Unfortunately, this is a photo of my mom who fractured her wrist about 10 years ago. We were in Florida walking at Disney World, in fact, on a dark evening. And there was a, a part of the sidewalk that unfortunately was um, not functioning very well. And she tripped over a brick fell and fractured her wrist. And sadly, she is not alone. In fact, about one third of people over the age of 65 fall every year. And now we've got about 60 million people over the age of 65 living in the United States. So that means we have about 20 plus million people who are over the age of 65 who fall every year. Unfortunately, some of those falls are injurious too. They lead to injury. In 2018, the last year, we have good data. Over 3 million older adults were treated in emergency rooms for fall-related injuries um, and almost a million hospitalizations and tens of billions of dollars in direct medical costs. Sadly, we have well over half a million fractures occurring each year. Similar to my mom, the wrist is one area that we tend to fracture. The one we get really worried about are hip fractures. Hip fractures lead to a long period of time of limited mobility, and that's when diabetes, heart disease, pulmonary disease really begin to ramp up, and many people don't last a year. In fact, about 20% of folks who have a hip fracture die within a year, and many of those who do survive never reach that level of function they had prior to their hip fracture. Maybe they go from walking to a cane, a cane to a walker, a walker to a wheelchair, um, and maybe go from living independently to living in a skilled nursing facility. So the data is really, really striking. And just to make this a little bit more personal, 
I'd like Lola to pull up our first poll where we're going to query all of you as to whether you have had a fall that has led to an injury or whether you know somebody close to you who have had a fall that has led to an injury. So please take a moment and respond to this poll. Dr. Thompson, like your mother, my grandmother also fell and she was about 94 years old at the mm -hmm. time. She lived to 96 and she actually fell while in the hospital. She was transferring yeah. from, from the bed to the commode, the bedside commode, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the wheels weren't locked and they went out mm -hmm. from underneath her. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, those last two years of her life were, you know, she never got her mobility back. And so personally, I, you know, I'm on the bandwagon that I want to teach as many people as possible what they can do to reduce their, their fall risk. And so that's why it's so important that we um, listen to you today because you are the expert. And we have, um, let's see, almost everybody has taken the, the poll. So I'm going to All go All right. Let's check out the results. Yeah. Let's share these results. Okay. So okay. 43%. So actually, even a larger percentage of people on today's webinar than what we would expect if we looked at people and polled people nationally. Certainly knowing other people that had falls, if, if you haven't had one, it's likely somebody in your network has. And I'm really grateful that 20% of you haven't had this experience yet. But just recognize it's unfortunately waiting around the corner for you because we're about to get into some risk factors that relate to fall risk. So thanks for running that poll, uh, Lola, and I will continue on with our Prezi here. Sadly, all, there are 200 plus risk factors that exist outside of our body and inside of our body that can really increase the likelihood of somebody ending up on the ground. Uh, Mary Tanetti, who is a physician at Yale University, she's considered sort of the godmother of fall prevention research. And I guess she had kind of a, a day with some time on her hands back in 1986 and started to tally all these different risk factors that exist that could lead to falls. And she came up with over 160. And of course, 1986 was before things like our smartphones were invented. So now with all the technological stuff that distracts us, we're over 200 different risk factors that can lead to us falling. Things like bad weather conditions or San Francisco, as we know, are known for not the best sidewalks. So those outdoor conditions aren't very good and can certainly predispose somebody. Within our own homes or apartments, we may have obstacles, whether it's, it's pet toys or whether it's a nice rug that perhaps we purchased on a, on a trip to Europe years ago, and that rug isn't really fastened well to the floor, or perhaps we don't have the adaptive devices going upstairs or in our bathrooms to help to reduce falls by having something to grab onto. Even poor lighting, whether it's outside or in our own home environments, we might not see that rumple in the carpet or that crack in the sidewalk. So, so many factors that affect us outside of our own body, and even sometimes the things that we choose to wear. Maybe you're going to the symphony and you're, you're wanting to enjoy time with family. Well, perhaps as you're going to the concession area during the break, high-heeled shoes you might be wearing might not be the best choice to be able to keep you up and mobile when perhaps people are bumping into you going through the lobby of the Davies Symphony Hall. Perhaps you might be wearing a few layers of clothing when you're on Muni or getting on or off um, uh, a BART train, God forbid if you have to take BART, and, and you might get a cot on a doorknob or somebody might be kind of sitting on it and that can throw you off balance. So many extrinsic factors are out there that can lead to a fall. And I did want to specifically dial in on something that Cal had mentioned earlier, the fact that our home environments are really important to be essentially fall proof. So the second poll we're going to take right now, Lola, is whether or not you have had your home or apartment evaluated for risk for falls and if there have been any modifications made to your home. 
So let's take a moment and do this one. All right, so we have our viewers taking our poll. And for those of you watching the recording, um, you know, the, these are things to add, to make sure you're aware of that home evaluations are available to you, especially if you're living in a Sequoia living community. So um, we want to always keep people as safe as possible in their homes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very I'm true. Go share the results here. Okay, only 15% of people have had their home evaluated. So a couple of things, organizations like Sequoia Living, if you're living in one of their CCRCs, there are opportunities to have your apartment evaluated by the therapy care team associated with Sequoia. Out in the community in the Bay Area, there are organizations such as Rebuild Together, which is a nonprofit organization that will come in and do home hazard checks and even provide some grant related funding to do things like install grab bars or improve lighting. So there are resources out there. I would strongly recommend people who have not had their home evaluated yet to consider getting in touch with your county. Every county has an area agency on the aging and your county agency can connect you with some resources in the community that will come in and do home hazard checks. So that's always a really, really good way to go because that is one piece of the puzzle that we can hopefully take care of to reduce our fall risk to a degree. So thank you very much, Lola, for putting that poll up. And now we have to go to the things that occur inside of our body um, because clearly how our body functions is gonna have some relation as to whether we're going to be falling or not. There are chronic medical conditions that are highly related to fall risk. Somebody who may have arthritis in a knee or a hip, it can affect the way that person walks, the way that person distributes their weight, which then creates a higher risk of falls. Acute medical conditions. I actually have read a couple of articles recently talking about the sort of cognitive brain fog that is a symptom of COVID-19. And that kind of brain fog is tied to a greater risk for falls. Somebody who is diabetic, perhaps their vision or the sensation in their feet is a little bit impaired, which can lead to falls. So, so many different uh, things that we might be dealing with as an older adult can definitely impact and increase our risk for falls. Poor vision, poor hearing, uh, audiology is oftentimes overlooked, but almost as important as poor vision. We might not hear something that's coming at us, so we might not be able to prepare or anticipate a loss of balance if we don't hear well. And also our vestibular system. of balance as we move through our environment, our vestibular system tends to get worse as well. Okay, um, additionally, medication. Many of us are on medication. It is estimated that the average person over the age of 65 is on five different medications, a combination of over-the-counter and or prescription medications. And those medications themselves can lead to a risk for falls. Antihypertensive medication, if you have high blood pressure, that might cause you to get dizzy when you go from sitting to standing. A medication that you might be taking for um, anxiety can lead to sort of a person not being fully aware of their environment. Medications that we take even for the common cold might make us drowsy and not as aware of our environment as we could be. So having a pharmacist or members of your medical team regularly review the medications that you are taking is always a good idea. It seems to be that people who are over-medicated have a greater risk for falls. So talk to your pharmacist, talk to your medical team, and ensure that on a regular basis, you are just having your, medic your medicines evaluated for whether or not they're increasing your fall risk. We call that a brown paper bag checkup. You take a bag with all your medications in it, 
give it to your pharmacist and ask that individual to evaluate if you are increasing your risk of falls based on your medicines and your dosages. And oftentimes we might find that your medical team will need to modify your uh, medication regimen in order to make sure that is better in check. Poor nutrition plays a role as well. I'm gonna give you the big three. Obviously getting enough calories and maintaining a healthy body weight is important, but we wanna make sure protein is in good amount in our diet because that helps maintain muscles that can help us resist and recover from trips and stumbles. We also need vitamin D. Vitamin D, which we commonly associate with bone health, also helps us activate our muscles powerfully. So to stop that trip or stumble, we need to move quickly and vitamin D helps to activate those muscles to do so. And then finally, calcium, calcium to build our strong bones. So those are the, what we consider to be the, the main three nutrients that really relate to reducing fall risk. And unfortunately, a lot of us just aren't paying enough attention to those three nutrients. So I would highly urge people that live at a Sequoia Living's facility, you can connect with a dietitian either on staff or who consults with each CCRC. That's a great way to go. And consider those of you outside of Sequoia Living, perhaps try to uh, connect with your primary care physician who may be able to connect you with a registered dietitian. And then finally, the stuff I love, which is our functional level. How strong are we? How mobile are we? How well can we keep our balance? How well do we walk in our environments? Things that we can modify in response to a well-structured exercise program. So that's where we're going today. And I really wanna make a push to all of you that we tend to consider things like falls as what happens to our grandmother in the hospital. Maybe only kind of the most frail older adults are at risk, but that is not true at all. There has been some really good research lately, including a huge dissertation that was done up at University of Western Ontario, looking at the prevalence of falls in even older athletes. This photo you see on this slide was taken during the senior games three years ago in Albuquerque, New Mexico. These two guys were running a race right on the track, obviously highly trained athletes who have worked hard to get to a national competition. And clearly they bumped into each other as they were running and they both fell down. So we have to recognize that it's not just the really low fitness folks, possibly it's the high fitness folks who are still doing things like hiking on slippery trails, skiing down mountains on skis, running in track meets, playing golf, playing tennis, playing pickleball. The fact is that people who are highly active may be choosing relatively risky activities. And nothing's worse to take somebody down a few notches from being highly fit to perhaps dependent than the effects of a bad acute fall. So please, just because you think that you've got it figured out, recognize that those 200 risk factors are just waiting for you out there somewhere. So let's try to ensure that we're incorporating into everybody's life some activities that are specific to reduce fall risk and improve balance. Okay, so let's talk a bit about what happens in the body that ensures or unfortunately predisposes older adults to be more likely to have a fall. Okay, we have 200 risk factors out there and we have three small fall defense systems in our body, which tend to get worse as we get older. Doesn't matter how fit we are. Vision tends to get worse just as a part of the biological aging process. About a month ago, I met with my optometrist for my yearly uh, optometry appointment and I was told I've got the start of my first cataract. What a bummer. So I'm 51 years old and I've already got kind of a little evidence of a cataract. And I know over time, that's just going to get worse. And poor vision can lead to a risk for a fall. Even just when bright lights get in our eyes at night, it makes it difficult for us to see. 
it kind of blinds our field of vision because changes in the eyes we get older cause us to have much more difficult time looking at light in a dark environment. That blinded vision can lead us to tripping over a curb or falling down uh, a step or, or something perhaps even worse. So vision is a big thing that's affected as we get older. Our inner ear, the vestibular system, right? This is what helps us detect whether we're moving forward and backward, side to side, or rotationally. We have these fluid-filled sacs in our inner ears. Those, unfortunately, get less sensitive as we get older. If you ever are chatting with somebody who's older and they're standing, you might even visibly notice that they are showing some postural sway as you talk to them. And you're talking perhaps to a younger person who seems to be very rigid and they don't show that sway. That is evidence that the vestibular system is getting a little bit less sensitive with age. We require a little bit more motion of the head before we make a corrective response. And sadly, this is something that just like, especially for us guys, the hair on the top of our head tends to fall out as we get older. These sensory hairs inside these fluid filled structures also get less numerous as we get older and lead to less sensitivity of our vestibular system. And in a really bad case can lead to vertigo where we sense that like our head is spinning. We really can't see and everything is shifting in front of our vision which could be really problematic if you're up and walking around, that could easily lead to a fall. Then the last element that we don't really talk about much is what's known as your somatosensory system. And it's basically the nerve endings, either in your hands or in this case, in your feet. And these are the nerve endings that help us detect what sort of surface we're on. Your feet can tell you, are you on a flat surface or an angled surface? Is it a wet surface? Is it a dry surface? Is it a stable surface or is it a slippery surface? And all of these nerve endings are in the skin, in the joints of the feet, the ankles, the knee, the hips. And as we get older, we tend to find that those joint structures get stiffer and they move a little bit less, which then leads to less sensory receptors getting turned on. So we get less information to the brain and we don't necessarily know how to adapt our movement strategies to be safer because we're simply not gathering as much information from our somatosensory system as we did earlier in life. So those are three little systems, all of which go down the tubes, even if you are highly fit. So another reason why it's one third of people over the age of 65. There are some other functional capacities that get worse. This uh, little diagram here to the side is a little bit of a schematic of what your uh, muscle tissue sort of looks like. So we can imagine it looking like a web, a nice web where we've got the ability to move the muscle through a full range of motion. But then if we look at, as we get older, when our muscle tissue sort of begins to get tighter, and it tends to bundle up and give us cramps at night or sensations of inflammation and soreness, we can see that we actually get less flexibility within the connective tissues in and around our muscles. And therefore we're not able to move through a range of motion as effectively. And it really creates less stability and less mobility in joints of our body, such as our ankle and our hip. And what we really want are our joints to be able to move well and also bear weight. So we call that mobility and stability. So as we go through this aging process, our joint structures, our muscle structures and connective tissue structures begin to get worse. So they aren't as mobile and stable as they once were. And we start losing our most ability, um, which isn't good. And then also we have to really be concerned about how strong our muscles are and how powerful they are. In other words, the ability to move quickly and powerfully in order to recover from something like a stumble. You need to move faster than gravity. If your muscles aren't able to move quickly, 
then it's likely the stumble is going to lead to a fall. And what happens as we get older, in the absence of a good training program, we lose muscle mass, we end up with something that is known as sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass to threaten our independence. And also we stop turning on our fast acting muscles. We've got two types of muscle, type one muscle, good for endurance, like long walks, type two muscle, good for powerful movements, such as throws, kicks, stomps, or quick recovery steps if we lose our balance. And unfortunately, those type two muscles tend to get turned off in our brain and we can't activate those muscle fibers as effectively as we get older. So we need to train them to keep them active. All right, so all these age-related changes unfortunately lead to changes in integrated functions as well. We start noticing that our gait, the way that we walk, begins to change. Perhaps we're now shuffling our feet and shuffling our feet definitely increases a risk for a fall because we might trip over something. Our static balance, our ability to keep our balance when our feet are not moving off of their, their base of support, but we still might have to reach for something and we can lose our balance during a reaching task. And then dynamic balance, where we're actually moving through open space, dynamic balance is affected by a loss of those functions as well. So these three integrated functions play a role in our everyday activities and put us at risk if we're not focusing on the physical components that cause them to be as good as they can be. So we're gonna discuss different exercises that can improve gait, improve static balance, and improve dynamic balance. We're almost to a point where we can take questions, but I want to cover one more thing because folks say, well, I work on my balance. My doctor told me to practice standing on one foot while I brush my teeth or while I'm doing the dishes at the sink. I practice standing on one foot. Well, that's good. I guess that's a start. But balance is very complex. Balancing well during a yoga class where we might be holding a balance pose looks a lot different than maintaining our balance as we're skiing down a ski slope where we're not staying still. So we have to recognize that the body needs to be maintaining its ability to stay upright both during stationary tasks but also during moving tasks. And it's this interaction between the environment that we're found in. So are we moving? Are we stationary? Are we inside? Are we outside? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it light? Is it dark? And all of that information needs to be considered by the central nervous system in order to tell the muscles to do the right things to keep us on our feet. And if there's any sort of, uh, let's see, let's try to think of a really scientific word. If those things aren't congruent with each other, okay, if there's any mix up between the environment, our central nervous system and our musculoskeletal system, we're gonna be in a situation where we're going to lose our balance and perhaps even end up falling. So just standing on one foot is not enough to reduce your fall risk and practice balance because balance changes sometimes from moment to moment. What you need to do with your body to keep your balance changes from one second to another. And we need to train ourselves to be ready for all of it. All right. And that really tells us that it's our brain that controls so much of our ability to maintain balance and walk effectively. Our brain turns on our muscles. That's the motor cortex of the brain. The basal ganglia and cerebellum of our brain help us refine our movement patterns so that we can perhaps adapt a movement pattern that's safer on a dry surface and a different movement pattern that's safer on a wet surface or have a movement pattern that's good going uphill versus a different movement pattern that's better going downhill. So our brain is always planning and refining 
how the muscles and the joints are going to move in order to accommodate the best situation for us to keep our balance. And then, and only then, does it get to our muscle fibers that actually produce the muscle contractions. So recognize when we're doing training, we're training our brain as much as we're training our body. Okay, I would love to take a few questions. I see there have been a couple of question and answers. Uh, Lola, if you don't mind, come on and, and let me know what yeah. sorts of questions we're getting. Yeah, so anybody can ask a question right now by typing their question in the Q&A box. And so we have one so far. Do we need a professional trainer to put an exercise program together for us and monitor how we are doing? The goal is today you're going to get the building blocks to kind of do stuff on your own and see how you start adapting to some of the new exercises you're, you're going to be learning. Certainly as time goes on, it's always good to get specifically evaluated, see what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and then have a training program that's going to work on bolstering the weaknesses, but still maintaining your strengths. And that's a process that oftentimes would require an evaluation, whether it's by a physical therapist, by a kinesiologist, by an exercise professional, but we're gonna give you some tools today to at least get started. And um, Dr. Thompson, you mentioned some county and government agencies that can help with home evaluations. Can you tell us more about that and what those agencies are? Sure, so every county has an agency, an area agency on the aging. So it is a department specific to working with older adults and addressing older adult issues within every county. San Francisco has the Department of Aging Services. Uh, that is a, a big office that actually funds our always active program that we offer at Sequoia Living and other places. They have an exhaustive list and it's possible even Sequoia Living might have some recommendations of organizations, nonprofits that are out in the community that can do home evaluations. A big one that is uh, throughout the Bay Area is called Rebuilding Together. Rebuilding Together. They are a big organization that will have volunteers come out and go through a checklist to look at home hazards. And then there is a grant application process for people who maybe don't have the funds to do so to try to get some modifications put in. They'll, they'll bring in contractors and install grab bars or install better lighting, those sorts of things. And I also know that there are resources mm -hmm. online that have checklists. So like the CDC has, um, has a website with different fall prevention uh, advice as well as the National Council on Aging. Correct, correct. Okay, one more question or should we keep going? Because we let's, still got to exercise. Yeah, let's keep going. Let's get exercise. Okay. All right, sounds great. Okay, folks, so let's talk about some basics of exercise training to improve balance and really what it takes to ensure that we are dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's to reduce our fall risk and improve our physical function. All right, there was a study that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association a couple of years ago this is what's called a meta-analysis, a huge statistical analysis of research that included over 15,000 older adult participants and found that exercise is the most important element to include in any fall prevention program. We've talked a bit about medication management. We've talked a bit about home hazard reduction. We definitely want to advocate for vision and hearing checks. And we also want to advocate for kind of support groups. And, and there are a number of programs where people can talk with one another and share ideas about what might have helped them in improving their environment and reducing their fall risk. But I will say research has proven that exercise will exert the strongest effect of any of those components of a fall risk reduction program. In fact, it's been shown that 11% of our falls could be reduced due to a person engaging in good exercise. And remember, we said about 60 million older adults in the country, about 20 million fall every year. So if we reduce that incidence by 11%, 
we're talking about 2 million less people in the United States falling every year. So exercise can move the needle and move it significantly. So recognize we want a multifactorial approach. We wanna to talk to our doctors about our medications. We want to have our home evaluated. We want to have our eyes and our ears checked, but we also need to have exercise. So I won't belabor this again. Static balance is basically the ability for you to keep your balance when your feet are not moving. So not during walking, not during stepping, but when you're standing there. And that tends to get impaired if we have poor mobility of the ankle and the hip and tends to get impaired if we have poor strength. So those are things we're gonna work on in just a moment. Dynamic balance, the ability to recover your balance after stepping, after uh, maybe you have to move quickly and hop or jump or you're recovering after a stumble, that is recovering balance after movement. It's a very dynamic sort of thing. And it requires us again to have ankle and hip flexibility it requires our vision and our vestibular system to help keep us oriented our environment. And it really requires that power, that lower body quick moving capability, which we will practice in one of our dynamic balance exercises. And then gait, how important gait is. I mean, gait or walking is one of the most fundamental capacities that we have to enable living independently. We walk to or from around our apartments, our homes. We walk to or from the store. We have to walk upstairs. We might be out on hiking trails. We might be walking like here in New York City and getting bumped into. We need to be able to rely on our gait, regardless of what environment that we're in, to ensure that we can stay balanced as we go about doing this really fundamental activity. So we want to ensure that we train our gait to be as safe and as resilient as possible. Okay, and really what we need to recognize about the gait cycle is we have a period of time where we're bearing weight on a leg. That is known as the stance phase. So if we look at this one picture, the light green leg is needing to bear weight. That's the stance phase. The dark blue leg is doing the swing phase where it's going to the next foot strike. So we need stability and strength in the stance phase, and we need mobility, especially at the hip and the ankle, to swing the leg effectively during the swing phase of gait. So we need to practice both stance and swing if we want to improve our gait, and we'll see how to do that in just a moment. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, we're gonna get straight to practice. I want you all to make sure that you've got a little bit of a safe space around you, have a chair or a counter, and only do what you're comfortable with. We're gonna go through five different exercises together, just watch some videos that I have produced, and then uh, you can continue to practice them on your own. So Lola, any other questions or should we get to the practice? Let's get to the practice. For anybody who's asked a question that's in our Q&A box, we will answer it via email. Sounds fantastic, I'm happy to do that. Okay, folks, so first thing we're gonna do is a joint mobility exercise. Here we go. Get ready to move those hips. This is a level two joint mobility exercise for the hip called seated hip steps. Our hips need to be very flexible joints in order to help us maintain our balance and recover our balance during motion. The problem is as we get older and as we accumulate a lot of sitting, our hips tend to get very, very tight. So this is an excellent exercise to start counteracting that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start seated forward in the chair as I am here with the back away from the chair. You want freedom of motion of the legs. I'm gonna place my right hand on my, on my lap. I'm simply going to step out and step back. We're gonna do this for 30 seconds per side. Step out, step back, step out, step back. Almost feel like you're making an L between your two legs during the hip step. Keep it going, you should feel some work going on within this hip joint. It's okay to feel a little bit of exertion going on in there. That's what we want. 
And now we're going to switch sides. We'll do another 30 seconds on this side as well. Notice how I'm keeping my foot directly underneath my knee. My foot and my knee are moving together. I'm not just shifting my foot. My entire leg is moving through this range of motion. That ensures that the motion is taking place here at the hip where I want it and not just at the knee and at the foot. Very good, nice big step and we will take that to a close. Excellent job. That was a level two uh, joint mobility exercise for the hips called seated hip steps. Okay, so there's a good one. Let's actually practice one where we're bearing weight because we want that stability along with that mobility. So I will demonstrate this one to all of you and feel free to participate. I'm going to stand, have my feet shoulder width apart, put up a couple of fists. I'm going to rotate and punch, rotate and punch, rotate and punch, Dr. Thompson? rotate and punch. Yes. If you um, stop sharing your screen, we can see you full screen. And it'll oh, that's a great back. idea, Lola. Yeah. Okay, so again, we're going to rotate and punch, rotate and punch. Here, I'm rotating the hip. I'm shifting weight from one foot to the other, and I'm having to express stability and mobility because I'm moving through a full range of motion and also needing to bear weight on one foot at a time. So rotating punches would be a good additional exercise to those hip steps. Okay, I'm gonna get back to sharing screen again. We'll go to our next exercise. And our next exercise is going to be a sensory stimulation exercise. Get ready for a little challenge. Have something that you can hold on to with uh, a fingertip, perhaps a chair. This is a standing exercise. This is a level two sensory stimulation exercise called shifting eyes forward march with support. We do sensory stimulation exercises in order to challenge our three balance mechanisms, our balance control mechanisms that we have in our body. We have our vestibular system, our inner ears. We have our vision, and we have the nerve endings on our feet, which send information up to our brain. All three of those systems work together to give us an idea of where our body is in space, and then allow us to maintain and recover our balance should we be having uh, motion occurring within the body. So the best way to train these three systems is by challenging the systems. This particular exercise is going to challenge vision by removing it. What I'm gonna do with this exercise is shift my eyes back and forth, following and tracking my finger for the entire exercise. I've made a makeshift table here this is something that you might find at home. Maybe it's a kitchen table. You can even go along a wall, along a corridor. You just want some space where you can move through space and use the uh, support for a little bit of safety for you. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We are going to remove vision by shifting our eyes back and forth, and we're simply going to march down and back for one minute. You know what we'll actually do? Let's march in place. So I'm gonna stop share. I'm going to bring my chair out here. I'm gonna place my fingertip on the chair and I'm going to work on marching in place as I shift my eyes back and forth. Notice that as we do this, you're, I'm not using my vision to keep my balance. Everything is blurry in my field of vision. So now my inner ear needs to work harder. My sensation of marching on the floor needs to be a little bit more uh, acute so that I can keep my balance because I've challenged my vision and removed my vision from the equation. Really good. Now let's try one where we mix up the inner ear. We'll continue to march. And now let's shake our head back and forth, not too vigorously, but turn your head back and forth which will mix up the fluid in the inner ear and cause us to feel perhaps a little disorientation. If we can keep our balance in this situation, we're well on our way to being able to rely on our sensory systems to keep us balanced. Okay, we'll bring that to a close. Notice that little disorientation. 
And that's a couple of examples of sensory stimulation exercises that we should be doing when we're training a fall risk reduction program. Okay, next one we're gonna do. All right. Is a static balance exercise. This is a level three static balance exercise with a moving upper body called narrow stance forward reach. We want to train our static balance. Static balance is the ability to keep balanced with non-moving feet. So it sounds like the best way to train that we've learned is to stand on one Boo. leg. Number one, that's kind of boring. Number two, it's not that effective because we typically lose our balance in a static position when we're performing a reaching task or something with our upper body. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to establish a narrow stance. Put your feet together. And if that's too close, go a little wider. You just want to feel challenged, but that it's not impossible. But also, it shouldn't be too easy. Hand on the hip, and then we're going to reach forward as far as we can, and then come back. Reach forward as far as we can, and then come back. Your weight comes up to the front of the toes, and then we come back to centered. Reach forward and back. Notice I'm reaching directly forward. I'm not doing some kind of a collapse. Straight forward, straight back. We're going to do 30 seconds per side. There we go. So this is a non-moving with the lower body, but a balanced, challenged reach exercise. You'd want to also practice that reaching with the other arm. Perhaps you favor one side versus another, and you may find one side is easier than the other. Okay, we're going to move on to the next exercise, which is dynamic balance, where we actually do get some motion of the lower body. Okay, this is a step return exercise. This is a level two dynamic balance exercise called rocking feet. This is a great exercise to help us learn how to establish dynamic balance. That is our ability to balance our body in response to motion. So we're gonna move and establish balance. This is a really important thing for us to do on a regular basis and helps us reduce the risk for a fall. Okay, I'm gonna zoom forward. We'll actually do the exercise. Enough of me babbling. And balance. Forward and balance, back and balance. I'm rocking my feet. A great way for us to try to maintain good balance during this exercise is by focusing on pulling our belly button in, squeezing our tush a little bit, and making sure that when we come forward into a balanced position and backward into a balanced position, we stay really, really focused on staying over the center of that foot. Really great work. We're gonna switch our foot position and we'll do some on the other side. Rock forward, rock back. Notice how I'm fully transferring my weight. I'm actually lifting up onto the toe of the back foot and on the heel of the front foot. There we I go. All right. So that's a dynamic balance exercise where we're establishing and recovering balance after movement. Clearly, we can come up with a lot of examples of where that will be handy and help to translate to our daily life. Now, let's do one more which is our gait enhancement, drawing more attention to the way that we're stepping. And uh, we'll practice this one together. And that's our last exercise. This is a level four gait enhancement exercise moving in the sideways direction called side steps with a hip drop. Very important for us to work on gait enhancement or controlling the way that we walk in our environment, whether it's straightforward or in this case, side to side. We want to have good strength in our legs and also good stability in our body in order to control all of our stepping patterns. And this exercise is really gonna help develop that because we never know when we might have to move in a side to side direction, either planned or unplanned to keep ourselves safe and keep on our feet. So what we're gonna do is use in my case, this gate ladder or this mobility ladder next to me, all you need is about 10 feet or so of open space. Make sure it's a flat and a safe surface. It can be indoors or outdoors, but just make sure you're going to be safe. And we're going to move through this uh, particular space for the exercise. So here we go. 
I'm going to start with my feet together in a balanced, challenged position. I don't want to be falling over, but I want to feel like I'm a bit challenged to keep this position. And I'm going to move side with a hip drop, feet together. Side together, side together. The reach forward with my hands helps me counterbalance myself as I move through this sideways step. And I'm going to come back. Side together, side together, side together. Keep on going. This is a level four exercise, so it's not easy. We get some leg strength work as well. One more time down and back. There we go. So you get a sense of how that works both your stepping pattern and also involves strengthening the lower body as well. So if these kind of resonated with you and you're interested in them, there's always the opportunity to do more. Uh, my website, mobilitymatters.fit, very, very like probably half hour, 45 minutes worth of exercise videos. You can choose from beginner to intermediate to advanced and use the code mobility15 at checkout for 15% off. If you buy one, I think it's like 15 bucks for forever access. So opportunities for you to get started on your own, do some work on your own, get used to these types of exercises, and then certainly seek out at some point, kind of figuring out what your strengths and weaknesses are. So down the road, you know that you are as fall resilient as you can possibly be. So my contact information is here again, it's been great having an opportunity to talk to all of you. You can visit mobilitymatters.fit. You can email me at chris at mobilitymatters.fit. And I hope to see you around. I'm all over the city. And I'm certain that uh, if, you, if you go out looking for me, you're going to find me doing exercise somewhere. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Thompson. And I also want to um, thank... Sequoia Living and Senior Services for Northern California for making today's presentation possible. And you can view more educational webinars at sequoialiving.org slash webinars. And we'll also be sending out some email communications so that you can get all your questions answered and um, it'll direct you to our resource page on our website. Thank you again for joining.